Hey, hi, my name's Adam. Welcome to church. <laughs> Glad to have you here with us today. This is awesome. And uh, it's uh, week two of our United series, and we're jumping into this, uh, this whole entire month with big announcements. Last week we announced, and not just announced, but launched um, our Ignite campus here at the church, and we talked about that. We're excited about that. Next week we got more big announcements, and we're excited about that. But if you step back and just think about it for a moment... We're all a part of a church that has been here for 96 years. Like, that's actually a pretty incredible thing if you think about it for a moment. That's not the norm. Churches just don't go on forever. The fact that we've been here doing ministry in this city for 96 years is an incredible feat. But I had something that came to me. I had this this observation And I realized the other day that everybody here in this room today, right at this moment, if you look around, none of us were actually here when the church started. And that's an interesting thought if you think about it. Because what it tells us is that the the vision that this original founding members had, the original vision that they had for this church 96 years ago, it lived on past their lifetimes. It lived on to make a legacy for for 96 years. And what what I'm saying here is, if you think about it, each and every person in this room, we've actually jumped on to somebody else's vision along the way. It is to say, actually, that we are actually the the answer to somebody else's prayers. You are the result of a 100-year-old prayer meeting. Where a hundred years ago, there were people praying about there being a church in this region. Where, where, where 96 years ago, there was the first meeting where they got together and they gathered together and said, let's do ministry here in Victoria. Let's create a church that will exist not just for me, not just for my children, but my grandchildren, my grandchildren's grandchildren. And here we are, folks. We're 96 years into this thing. We've jumped onto somebody else's vision. And this is an exciting season for us as a church. Because just around the corner, tomorrow, we're going to announce some some new things. We're a part of something very real. And what I've noticed in life is that if you don't pass a vision on, the vision dies. If just one person carries it, and and, and they, 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 they hold it all to themselves, there's no moving on beyond that one individual. This is a principle that even Jesus understood. If you look back to Luke chapter 4, verse 40, let me, let me read something for you. You see, just when Jesus was starting off his ministry, uh, he was going around healing people, left, right, and center. And, and, and this was a really exciting time in this particular region. It says these words. It says, as the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Like that's the God that we serve. And if you think about that for a moment, that's pretty incredible. Every disease imaginable was getting healed. Jesus was setting people free. He was casting out evil spirits. He was, he was healing the sick. And he was doing this. And people were gathering. Word was getting out. Hey, did you hear about Aunt Susie? Hey, did you hear about Max? Hey, did you hear? That was totally not their names. Very, very not Eastern names. But whatever. But, but, but the, the, the rumors were going on. And people were gathering like crazy. And people were, were, were filling in the gaps and pouring into the streets. So much so, that in verse 42 it says, Early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him. And when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave. But then he replied. You see, and there's this piece of me that I have just an extraordinary amount of empathy for these people. Because because here, they were hearing these stories. People were getting healed all over the place. And there were still people in line wanting to meet with Jesus. There's still people in line with their sick loved ones and their their disease-ridden family members. They're trying to bring them over to Jesus. And Jesus is hiding. And then Jesus just retreats. And then Jesus comes out and says these words. Verse 43. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too. Because that is why I was sent. See, see, Jesus understood his purpose, his mission, his vision. There was intentionality behind what he did. 
He, he knew that there was a whole load of people to reach. And in him, as himself, he knew that he actually needed to share this vision with others. He actually needed to assemble a team. But actually, this is the almost ironic part of that story. He didn't really need to assemble a team, but he chose to. And it's an amazing privilege that we have. So he continues on, verse 44, it says, So he continued to travel around preaching in synagogues throughout Judea. And in chapter 5, verse 1, it starts out with Jesus actively starting to assemble his team to go out and, and, and bring this vision forward. He goes out to try and find people to, to become vision carriers. And in a lot of ways, that's what we've become here. We're vision carriers. We've jumped into a vision. We're carrying a vision. And we're, and we're believing that God is going to do an extraordinary thing. Not even just one thing. Extraordinary things, plural, across this island. But let's look at chapter 5, verse 1. This is when he starts to assemble the people. So chapter 5, verse 1 says this. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Let me, let me set the stage for you. So imagine we have a seashore here. And, and the Sea of Galilee is out there. And, and, and here on the shore are, are, are two boats that are parked up on the shore. And then, and then right over here, we have Simon, a fisherman. And, and he's cleaning out his nets. And he's taking debris out. He's taking weeds out. He's frustrated. He's discouraged. He had just gone all night. He'd caught nothing. I took my boys fishing the, the other day on Friday. We caught nothing. I can identify with this man. It's, oh, it's hard when you catch nothing. There's a whole lot of things inside of you that wants to come out when you leave there with nothing in your hands. And, and so here is, here is Simon. He's going through his nets. And he's frustrated. He's discouraged. Then in walks Jesus, of all people starts walking along the beach, and not only is Jesus there, but he's there with a whole crowd of people walking alongside of him as, as Simon is moping over there with his, with his nets, and as this scene takes place, let me continue. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, and the, for the fishermen had left them there, and they were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Now there is a, a, a serious piece of irony in this story. Because here, here we have Simon, completely disengaged, discouraged, not paying attention to anything in terms of Jesus He's not there for Jesus in the crowd. He's there because he happened to be there. He's there and having a pretty bad day. And he's there cleaning his nets. And of all people and of all places, Jesus chose to climb into Simon's boat. When Simon was disengaged, discouraged, and surrounded by a crowd of engaged listeners, Jesus sat in his boat. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was assembling a team, this is not where I would have started. You don't, you don't start with the disengaged guy. You don't start with the guy who is not even there to hear from you in the first place. Like intuitively, you would say, okay, which one of you keeners in the crowd is going to be a part of my team? But instead, Jesus calls out the guy who's disengaged, who's discouraged, and who's just sitting there. And tonight, you may find yourself in a very similar boat to Simon. You're here, it's Thanksgiving weekend. You're disengaged. You're probably on your phone right now. You're not even paying attention. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're walking through something right now. Life is real. The season's heavy. You're surrounded by people who, who are seemingly better off than you are. And you're sitting here in the middle of the crowd feeling isolated, alone. Well, of all the people in the world that Jesus could be speaking to tonight... What if God's speaking to you? You see, what if, what if this doesn't happen to be a coincidence? But what if God knew this whole thing was going on this whole time? What if God understood that Simon was going to be at the beach that day? What if this isn't a big, huge surprise? What if this isn't some kind of fluke, some kind of ironic story twist? But what if there's some intentionality there? And what if God knows that you're here tonight? 
And there's intentionality there as well. What if he set it up for you to be here? The story continues. When he had finished speaking, he, he, he said to Simon. And so, so you got you to picture this moment, right? Like, so the boat is in the water. Jesus is in the front of the boat. He's teaching the crowd. Simon's in the back of the boat, kind of keeping the boat afloat and, and, and level and, and doing his thing. Jesus finishes talking. And he looks back at Simon. He says, hey, listen, hey, hey, now why don't you go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish? And I can just picture myself as Simon, thinking to myself, would you just get out of my boat already? (laughs) Like, why are you even in here still? Oh, okay, fine, let's maybe go out. And there's this kind of like honest kind of frustration in there, this inner angst. There's almost this wrestle that's taking place. You see, your first step to jumping into a vision often looks more like a rational decision than it does a spiritual epiphany. And that's an interesting thought, because it's, 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 it's counterintuitive. Oftentimes, we go through life waiting for these very mystical, very super spiritual, very, very perfect moments. And what if we, what if in it, what if accidentally we end up missing the boat? What if we accidentally recognize that Jesus, what if we don't even realize that Jesus is in our boat for the first place? What if we're so busy looking at our situation, so busy looking at our surroundings, that we end up accidentally blinding ourselves? See, I can't help but picture this this conversation that would take place. You know, just before Jesus says, let's go out and get some more fish, I can't help but picture Jesus saying something along the lines of, Simon, I noticed you're pretty discouraged over there. Don't internalize things. Change the narrative, Simon. Like, like you're, you're not a bad fisherman. There, there are fish in the sea. Okay? Stop, stop becoming the victim. Let's, let's just go out deeper. Let's go catch some fish. We'll go out a little bit deeper. What do you say? And maybe there's people here this morning or this evening and God's saying the same kind of thing. I noticed you looked a little discouraged tonight. Don't, don't internalize things. Change the narrative. You're not a bad person. It's not that there's no places for you to serve in the church. Try talking the next steps. Try stepping out of your comfort zone. Your, 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 your pathway to freedom may be a lot more intuitive than you thought. Verse (laughs) 5, Master, Simon replies, Uh, we worked hard all night and and, and didn't catch a thing. And it's as if, as though he's kind of saying to himself, like, listen, Jesus, I'm a fisherman, you're a carpenter, so uh, lay off. (laughs) You know, Like, 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 I know what this feels like right now. But then he says something that kind of changes the script. He says, Masters, we work hard all night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. See, we don't typically think like that. But when jumping into the vision, it's important to realize that you can be both skeptical and obedient at the same time. And that's an important piece of the story. I mean, if I look back at the scriptures and I look at the 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Like, what do you think that actually looks like? What that looks like is your, your worldview is being violated. The way you understood life, reality, yourself, your position, things around you, the way you understood the system, it's getting violated. And when that system gets violated, you're going to feel skeptical as you get introduced to a new system of thinking, a new worldview. So this idea of skepticism actually isn't bad when you pair it with obedience. Because God understands how you work. 
God understands human nature. God understands that we feel most comfortable when we can control all of the variables. When we understand everything that's going on, we feel at our best. And God knows that about us. But this whole idea of walking by faith, not by sight, means that we're going to have some tension. And I am so thankful that we serve in a church that has learned how to wrestle with this tension through the years. Because I'll tell you this much, 96 years ago, the church didn't look anything like this, right? 96 years ago, at some point throughout our journey, I'm sure somebody came up and said, hey, listen, painting the whole stage black, I'm not sure that's a great idea, but I'll trust you. Hey, listen, spending all the money on this technology, I'm not sure that's the best use of our funds. I'm skeptical on this, but I'll trust you. You know, you know, church planting, I mean, we have a big facility. Why not have everybody just gather here? But you want to go out and reach the island and reach different communities and plant churches there? I don't know about that. I'm skeptical, but I'll trust you. And it's that level of faith that makes things move. See, we can't control everything all the time. There's this element of just trusting things to God. And we see this modeled in Simon there. I'm a fisherman. I get paid to do what I do. I mean, I am literally called a fisherman. I'm the professional here. Not you, Jesus. You're the spiritual leader. And I can tell you, Jesus, that this is not going to work because I was just out there all night last night. I'm not sure about this new tactic of yours. But I'll trust you. We'll see what you got. I'll put out the deeper waters. And we'll see if this is going to happen. And God moves. You see, there's this level of uncomfortability that we need to begin to get comfortable with if we're going to walk the Christian walk. So what happens? It says this, and this time, verse 6, and this time their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. In other words, jumping into the vision doesn't only benefit you, it actually benefits others as well. And we've done such a good job as a a, a church, kind of like the church, global church, of emphasizing our need for a personal relationship with Jesus. So much so that we forgot that our personal relationship with Jesus should also have public effects on other people as well. It's not meant to be this private thing between me and God and me and God alone. And this is so modeled for us, just so clearly here with Jesus and Simon in the boat. Because this story could have gone much differently. The story could have looked like this. Okay, I let my nets down. Okay, the fish are coming. Okay, my nets are beginning to tear. Okay, I'm going to put all the fish inside my boat. Hey, Jesus, do you see how good of a job you're doing at getting us fish? Make the boat stronger now. Make the boat walls come up. Make it so that we can have a larger capacity to hold more fish. Make this thing float. That way you and me can, can have this whole thing to ourselves. That's not what takes place. Instead, what takes place, the boat starts filling, so much so that the boat starts sinking. And instead of Simon turning around and saying, Jesus, we're going down, Simon looks out at his friends and says, friends, come on in. Come over here. See what God is doing? He's doing this in my life and he's going to do this in yours too. Like, look at at this. Look at how much blessing there is. Look at how much fish there is. Look at all this stuff that Jesus has provided. Look how real this guy in my boat is. Check this out. And this begins to impact not just Simon, but begins to impact others as well. And it's an extraordinary piece of the story. But then what happens next it's almost, it's, almost, it's almost unpredictable. Because you see what takes place here in verse 8. When Simon Peter realized what had just happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus. 
and said, oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. And, and, and I, I just, when I read those words, like that, I'm not sure that, that would be my first go-to response. Like I, I look at that and I think to myself, well, first of all, Simon, where's Jesus even going to go? You just told him to get out of the boat. It's only you and him out there. You're going you to make him swim back? But there's this, this moment of almost repentance, which is actually almost surprising. Because why would Simon start repenting when things were going so good? It's because all of a sudden Simon realized that he's not the one that caught the fish. It's Jesus. That Jesus isn't just this theoretical spiritual guru. But when Jesus says things, things happen. When Jesus leads you, he, 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 follow, like he, he guides you, he walks with you. He doesn't just send you out to struggle on your own, but when he tells you to go into deeper water, he provides. And there's this moment where Simon, just, just face to face with Jesus, breaks down. Because jumping into the vision causes you to reevaluate your personal motives and agenda. You see, Simon could have gone home and told the most amazing fishing story ever. Simon, in fact, could have turned this whole thing around and started quite the fishing charter business. He say, have you ever caught so many fish that not only your boat began to sink, but your friend's boat began to sink? Come, let me take you out, and you will be a wealthy man. You are going to love life because I am the fishing guru. He could have gone that way, but he realized that's not how this works. That's not what just happened. Jesus touched my life, and everything changed. And he gets rattled, and he realizes I, 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 I need to make this right. This whole, this whole vision thing got, got, got personal, personally impacted. In fact, it wasn't just him. Verse 9, he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the other fishermen, or as were uh, the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. But then Jesus replies, and his answer back is so curious. He says, Simon, don't be afraid. Which is interesting because at no point did Simon say that he was scared. He, 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 he looked up at Jesus. He says, no, Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. But Jesus sees through all of what's going on. He says, no, Simon, you're scared. You're scared that this is real. You're scared because you can't make sense of everything. You're scared because what you heard about me is true. You're scared because you don't understand how to apply all this to your context. You're scared because you think I'm going to judge you. You're scared because you think I'm going to throw you out of the boat. So calm down. So don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. And Simon, he, he, he jumps into this vision. And he leaves everything behind. He says, I'm going to follow this guy. I want to glean from him. I want to learn from him. You see, what I've learned from this is jumping into the vision can change your life. But only if you let it. Because as I said, Simon could have chalked this up as an incredible fishing story. Instead, he didn't do that. Instead, he, he paddled him way into shore and got out of his boat and left everything that represented that old identity behind. And Jesus, interestingly enough, transforms him from a fisher of fish to a fisher of man. Not throwing out his identity, but readjusting it, realigning it. And I feel like that's a lot of what God wants to do tonight too in some of your hearts and some of your lives. There's a piece of you that's panicking a little bit. It's like, oh man, to follow Jesus, I gotta, I gotta get rid of everything. The truth is, yeah. 
but it doesn't look the way you think it does. God has this way of, of, of realigning the passions, the giftings, the talents, the skills that he's placed inside of you. And when we surrender everything to him, God has this amazing ability to turn it all around and, and, and create us into that person he in- initially created us to be. So I'll close tonight by asking you this question. And my question for you tonight is, what is God asking you to do? It's an exciting season for us as a church. It's Vision Month. Our series is called United. We're many yet one. We believe that we're better together. You're not just a spectator in that pew this evening. You're, you're, you're part of the vision. You're part of the vision. But what is God asking you to do tonight? Maybe he's asking you if he can sit in your boat. And he's looking at you and he's saying, can I, can I, can I sit in there? And maybe you've been here for a while, maybe you've been here for the first time. But you know in your heart of hearts that tonight God, God's, God's getting personal. It's not so much just being a part of the crowd and watching, listening to Jesus. It's not so much standing on the shore and watching Jesus go out and do something in someone else's life. But tonight, very personally, God is asking you, can I sit in your boat? Can I be a part of your life? Yeah, I see that you're not perfect. I see, I see that you're, 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 you're not fully engaged right now. I see that but I see things you don't see. I see you for who you can be, not just who you are, not just what's happened to you. So can I sit in your boat? For some of you tonight, I think God's asking you to push off from shore. You see, you have Jesus in your boat, and I celebrate with you. It's awesome. Jesus is in your boat. That's great. And you, you, you don't have a care in the world because Jesus is in your boat. That's fantastic. The problem is, though, Jesus is in your boat and you're still on the shore. And boats weren't made for the shore. Boats were made for the water. It's in the safest place it can be. You're safe. You're comfortable. You're in the right spot. You're doing things right. But in this season... I believe God is calling some of you to push off, to trust him, to go out into the water, to see what it is that he has for you. Sure, you can stay on shore all the days of your life, but you were created for more than that. For some of you tonight, I believe God is calling you to cast your nets into deeper water. You have Jesus in your boat, You know enough to push off from shore, but you're floating in the bay, and you're safe, and you've just been kind of going with the motions for a while. You've been doing great things. You've been doing everything that the boat was built for. Like, you're in the right spot. Don't feel ashamed. But I believe God wants to touch you tonight. God wants to speak to you tonight. And I believe that in this next season, God is calling you out into deeper water. He's saying, son, daughter, I built you for more. There's more capacity in you. There's more life in you. There's more leadership in you. There's more gifts in you. There's more more potential in you. Don't settle for the bay. Go out into the water. And he's not sending you by yourself, so don't panic. He's with you the whole time. That's the most interesting thing about this story, is Jesus travels with you. You don't need to be afraid. Some of you may need to call some friends for help. God's noticed that you've done a great job in the boat. You and him are really tight, really great. But even Simon, when all those fish were coming, he called out to other people for help, not to just to Jesus. And I think there's something there in that text. You're not meant to be alone. There's a reason why God's rescue plan for humanity is the local church, is people, not just a individual. 
He wants you to be in community. Maybe you need to sign up for a small group. Maybe you need to be, take some intentional steps to get connected here at the church. Maybe it's grow track to, to, to come and find out different ways that you can serve. Maybe it's the welcome party. Because I can tell you right now, Christianity is supposed to be about more than just sitting in a pew and watching, watching someone talk. It's meant to be about doing life with one another. I mean, Jesus was literally building a team of people, literally building a small group. Like, small groups are a thing. Get connected with people. Some of you, you may need to... Some of you may need to repent tonight. Just like Simon in that boat. He saw, he saw Jesus work. He saw Jesus for real do something in his life. And it brought him to his knees. And he got his heart right with God. And that might be your story this evening. Like Simon, you didn't expect to encounter God that day. You didn't expect to encounter God tonight. But there's something inside of you that says, you know what, this Thanksgiving weekend, I have a whole lot more to be thankful for than what I've originally thought. Jesus is real. And he's on my side. And finally, perhaps tonight God's calling some of us to, to leave stuff behind and start a new season. Like Simon, as he, he came to shore and he, and he left this, his identity as a fisherman behind. Maybe there's certain things in your life where you need to intentionally leave it behind. Because you can't move on unless you deal with this particular issue. And it's not going to be easy, but it is actually simple. You just need to take that first step. And trust Jesus with the next one. Can I invite you to stand to your feet? I'd love to pray with you tonight. Let's maybe close our eyes and spend a moment with God together. Lord, we give you this moment. I thank you, Lord, for each and every person in this room. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you that you're real. I thank you that you care so much about us, Lord God, that you gave your son to die for us. Lord, if there's anybody in this room tonight who, as I've been talking, have thought to themselves, I want to know Jesus like he does. God, would you, would you start that relationship this evening? Friends, it starts with a, a, a prayer of repentance. Where we say, God, sorry for the things I've done. But thank you for, for, for believing in me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for giving me new life. Jesus, show us what that means. God, we need you. So, Father, we thank you tonight for the last 96 years of ministry. We thank you that we could jump into a vision that's already existed. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, what you've done, and what you're going to do. And God, we thank you in hope, with faith, with great expectations for this next season of us, uh, for us as a church. I pray, Lord, that you would stir something deep inside of us, God. That we wouldn't just settle for where we're at, but God, that you'd put a hunger and a curiosity inside of us for more. God, show us what our next steps is all across this room. What as individuals our next steps may be. Lord Jesus, open our ears to you. Open our eyes to you. God, give us the, the courage to step out. Lord, we need you. God, we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.